we submit ourselves to you. Pray that now as your word is proclaimed that it will reach to our hearts. God, if there's anyone here who does not know you, God, that right now faces the reality of being an object of your wrath, that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would turn and receive you and uh, receive the blessing uh, that goes with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. All right. Well, we've been taking a vote. How many people say, shave it off? (laughs) It looks ridiculous. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) How many say, keep it? It looks kind of cool. Thank you. Uh, Oh, gosh. That's it? What do you guys know? Um, My wife likes it, so we're keeping it. Um, (laughs) My friend Johnny uh, the other day was telling me a, a cat got run over in front of his house. And, uh... And he has several small kids, so he, uh, he took his kids out in the middle of the street and made them look at the cat and said to them, this is why you don't play in the street. <laughs> okay, now some of you guys listen to that and you go, gosh, that's kind of rude. You know, others of you go, right on, you know. I mean, the kids need to see that. Now why, though, why did he do that? Why would Johnny have his kids come out and look at this cat? Is it because he wanted to torture them? He wanted to give them nightmares? No. He did it out of love. He wanted it. He wanted to warn them. Because you know sometimes you tell your kids something, you go, hey, don't do this. You know, and they just kind of go, okay, yeah, whatever. And they don't understand the severity. And so you have to explain, no, you don't understand how dangerous this is. And so what he did with his kids was just a warning that was done out of love. Saying, look, you don't want to, you don't want to play around in the street. You don't want to cross the street when it's dangerous. Be very careful with it. Now, in the Bible, the Bible says that God is our Father. He is our Heavenly Father. And as a Heavenly Father, He gives us warnings. He, he tells us, you know, certain things about His law. And He says, look, listen to me. Obey them and things will go well. But if you don't obey me, if you disobey me, I've got to warn you, some things are going to happen. And and you see it in the Old Testament time and time again. God warns the nation of Israel. He says, I love you guys. And and if you will follow me, if you walk in my ways, there's going to be so much blessing coming your way. But if you disobey me and you reject my laws, then there's going to be my wrath that's going to come. In fact, if you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus, the third book in the Old Testament. Turn to Leviticus chapter 26. I want to give you an example of this. In Leviticus 26, in the first part of that chapter, God is telling the nation of Israel, look, if you will just follow my ways, if you'll listen to me and do what I ask you to do, there's going to be tremendous blessing upon you. But then starting in verse 14, he explains what happens if they don't listen to him. Leviticus 26, verse 14. I just want to read that to you. He says this. He says, but if you will not listen to me, And carry out all these commands. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. And you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sin seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruit. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I'll multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals against you, and they will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. If in spite of these things you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you, and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword upon you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. When you withdraw into your cities, I'll send a plague among you, and you'll be given into enemy hands. When I cut off your supply of bread, ten women will be able to bake your bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. In spite of this, 
If, if in spite of this you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you. And I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. Okay, it goes on, but I think you get the point. Okay? You guys, why? I mean, you got to just read that chapter sometime. And other warnings in the Old Testament. Why does God give such severe warnings? You got to understand, He does this out of love. Man, I think He's just making it worse and worse and worse and explaining how horrifying it is. Why? Because He wants His children to obey Him so He so that they don't have to face that. And you guys, as you read on in the Old Testament, what you find out is that God was not bluffing. Okay, As you read the history of Israel and you study that nation, you realize God was not bluffing. Man, when God said he would destroy them, he meant that. And when you read, and you know, I've been reading First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you, you see the nation of Israel, whenever they begin to honor God, God blesses them. And their enemies just flee from them. But when they begin to reject God and worship other gods, God's wrath is poured out upon that nation and ultimately destroys that land. And we understand that God's wrath is something that he is serious about. He is not just throwing out empty threats at the people, but he follows through on what he says. But what I want you to understand is God warns them ahead of time out of love. It is a loving father who is seeking to warn his children, you got to follow my ways so you don't face this wrath. And you guys, when I read the book of Revelation, I see Revelation as God's ultimate warning. It is the warning of a loving God saying, look, this is the result of your sin. This is my wrath that will be poured out upon you because of your sin. So repent, walk away from it so you can escape my wrath. You see, in Revelation chapter 6, as Paul says, we, we kinda, we're, we're kind of making a turning point in the book of Revelation here. And we start to talk about the actual end time events and how God is going to send his wrath upon this earth. But before we got into it, I wanted, I wanted to make sure you understood that the reason why God writes us is to warn us. Because he loves us and doesn't want us to face that. And he wants us to turn from our sins before it's too late. So it's not just to give you nightmares. It's not to, to, to just freak you out. But the point is, is he wants you to repent. He wants you to fall in love with him and escape his wrath. In Revelation 6, this is where a lot of the symbolism starts. You know, a lot of you read the book of Revelation for yourself, and you read the first five chapters, and you go, you know what, this isn't that hard to understand. I get it, I get it, I get it. Then you get to chapter 6, and you go, all right, forget it. And you close the book, and you go, I, I just don't understand all this symbolism. Well, this morning, hopefully I can help you understand it. Um, because the, the Bible, if you read it in its entirety, I think it really fills in the gaps and helps us to understand what these uh, these 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 uh, characters symbolize. Revelation 6, verse 1. It says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Okay, remember what has happened up to this point? Remember chapters 4 and 5? We see God on the throne. Remember that? God on the throne. He's got the four living beings around him. He's got the 24 elders laying down their crowns. He's got, he, he's got all, the multitude of angels, you know, Revelation 5, that are bowing down, worshiping him. Remember, he's holding a scroll. He's holding a scroll in chapter 5 with seven seals on it. And, uh, and no one can open up that scroll. And then Jesus comes. Remember that? Jesus takes the scroll and everyone just falls on their faces and worships. Remember that? Jesus, because he was the one who was worthy to break the seals. Now, remember the, the scroll somehow symbolized a, a title deed to the earth and how God was going to reclaim this earth for himself. And here in chapter 6, we see Jesus breaking off these seals one at a time because he has the authority to do so. And it's pretty dramatic because as he breaks each seal, different things happen. And it's, he, he gets different, John gets different visions of what's going to take place at the end times. So here in chapter 6, he says he breaks the first seal, the first of the seven seals. And he says, then I heard one of the four living creatures. Remember the four living creatures? They were flying around. Each had six wings. They had eyes all over their bodies. It says, one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice like thunder, come. Verse 2, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. 
Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Okay, what you're going to see now, okay, is during these first four seals that Jesus breaks, you're going to see four different horses come out, each having different colors. And the first, first one he sees, when he breaks the first seal, he sees a white horse. And on this white horse is this conqueror who was uh, bent on conquest. He's given a crown. He's got some sort of authority. He's holding a bow in his hand. Now, typically, when you see the color white, you think of holiness. You think of righteousness. You think of Jesus Christ, who's going to come dressed in white. But here, this is not referring to Jesus, because here, these four horses, to collectively, uh, they, they, they symbolize satanic forces that are going to destroy the world at the end times. So we know this is not Jesus, because he is mentioned later on. But this white robe symbolizes some sort of imitation of what is holy. Okay? Now, the Bible teaches that in the end times, there's going to come some sort of conqueror, some sort of world ruler. Okay? We can't be sure who this is, but I believe that this is a reference to Revelation chapter 13 and the Antichrist. Because in chapter 13, it, it explains that there's going to come a ruler who will come on this earth, and it's going to be a one-world government, a one-world currency. Um, it's hard for us to imagine that right now because we've got so many different nations and so many different governments. But the Bible does talk about a time when the world will be under one ruler. And uh, he is the Antichrist. He, he pretends to be someone holy, but he isn't. Um, and uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more as, as we go on. But here, I believe that's what he's describing, is the first thing that happens is this ruler that is going to come. But then he goes on in, in verse 3, and it says, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Okay, it says a second, a second horse with a rider came out, and this one's red, and it's a picture of war. Okay, so after this one conqueror comes, comes a period of war. And it says that he causes men to slay each other. Um, and what's interesting is, we don't have time to get into it right now, but in Daniel chapter 9 in the Old Testament, it talks about this man who is going to come and, uh, and how he's going to set up this, this covenant, this seven-year covenant or the seven-year treaty. Um, and then in the middle of the treaty, it's going to be broken. Three and a half years into it, right in the middle, it's going to be broken. And so some see this as a picture of that, that first comes the man who's going to bring the seven-year treaty. Then in the middle of it, after he's brought this peace on the earth, right in the middle of it, war is going to break out. So peace is taken from the earth just as it's spoken of here. And so that's what these first two riders symbolize. And in the end times, there's going to come a world ruler. Then partway into this reign, there's going to be all sorts of war, and men begin to slay each other. And then we move on in verse 5. Verse 5, it says, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay, so Jesus breaks the third seal, and now a black horse comes out, and the rider is holding a pair of scales, scales that you would weigh things on. And he hears a voice saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Now, a quart of wheat is what a typical human being would consume in a day in that time. Basically, I, I would eat a quart of wheat a day. And now what he is saying here, it says that a, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. That means I would have to work a full day's work and give everything just to get enough to feed myself. Okay, it's showing famine type conditions. And then he says, and three quarts, of, three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Now, barley was like a cheaper grain. It didn't have the same nutrients as, as wheat did. In fact, it would take three quarts. It's kind of like that commercial. It takes three bowls of cornflakes for one bowl total. But it's like <laughs> you take three quarts of barley for the nutrients in one quart of wheat. And so while it was more uh, substance and it could feed your whole family, it wasn't nutritional like, like wheat. So basically the picture here is a picture of famine, which happens a lot of time after war. 
You know, when so many things are destroyed, comes this time of famine. And that's why he says, don't uh, damage the oil and the wine. Okay, so you got the picture so far. The white horse first symbolizes this conqueror that's going to come. And the second horse symbolizes there's going to be wars to come. And the third thing that happens is famine is going gonna, is gonna to be, be all over the land. And then the fourth seal is broken in verse 7. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so he breaks open the fourth seal, and then comes a pale horse. The literal interpretation is a pale green horse. It's like the picture of a, a dead body. Okay, it's that coloring of death. And he says this pale green horse comes out, and it's a picture of death. And it says this symbolizes, um, it symbolizes the, the fact that a fourth of the world's inhabitants are going to die, either by the wars or by the famine or by plagues or by the beasts of the earth. A fourth of the earth will be killed at this point. So, so if that were right now, it would be like 1.2 billion people would die based upon that devastation that has just happened. And you guys, this is just the beginning. Okay, those are the first four seals. Then he gets to the fifth seal in verse 9. It says, When he opened the fifth seal, <clears throat> I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true? until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Okay, I want to spend some time on this one. This one's a little different because so far he's been explaining things that are going on in the world and how you know the wars and the famines and the death that's going on in the, in the world. But now he takes you into heaven, and you get to see the souls of those who have been martyred for their faith. These are Christians. These are Christians who have died during this period because the Antichrist is absolutely against Christianity. And you can read about that in Revelation 13. And so now you've got the souls of those who are in heaven crying out to God. And they're saying, God, when are you going to destroy the people on this earth? When are you going to avenge our blood? Now what's interesting about all these martyrs is this. If you have your Bibles, turn back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I just want to give you a glimpse of what Jesus taught his disciples would happen at the end times. And then I want you to compare it to what we've studied so far in Revelation. In Matthew 24, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he's talking to his disciples about the things to come. And in Matthew 24, verse 4, listen to what Jesus said when he was on earth. Verse 4, Jesus answered... Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. What did Jesus say was going to happen? First he said there's going to be false Christs. People who appear righteous, appear to be like Christ, that will come. He says, secondly, there will be wars and rumors of wars, just like the second seal. Third, he says there's going to be famines, just like the famine um, in, in the third seal. And he says there's going to be earthquakes. And then it says that, uh, he says after that, he says you'll be handed over to be persecuted and to be put to death. He's talking to believers, saying you're going to be martyred, you're going to be put to death. So you see the, 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 same, the same sequence of events that Jesus talks about in the Olivet Discourse is the same thing that John is seeing here in Revelation. You see the, the, the ruler who comes, who appears to be righteous, kind of a false Christ who is the Antichrist. You see the wars and the rumors of wars that take place partway through his reign. You see the famine and the death 
And then you see the persecution of believers that we have here and the, and the martyring of the believers. But what's interesting in this passage is these souls, going back to Revelation, they're crying out to God. What are they asking God? They're saying, how long, sovereign Lord? They're saying, God, you're in control. You're sovereign. That's what it means. You're, you have control over all things. So how long are you going to let this go on before you avenge our blood? Those people on the earth killed us for our faith. Take revenge for us. How long, sovereign God, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? And God's answer may shock some of you. Because what he says, verse 11, he says, Then each of them was given a white robe. That white robe, I believe, is a reward for their righteousness or faithfulness. But then listen to what happens. And they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed, as they had been, was completed. Do you understand God's answer to these people? When they're saying, God, when are you going to take revenge? When are you going to destroy them for destroying us? And God says, wait a little bit longer, because there are more believers who are going to be martyred just like you were. And I'm waiting for them to be martyred first. Now, does that answer kind of shock some of you? I mean, why wouldn't a a sovereign, all-powerful God right then say, okay, that's it. You know what? They killed my saints. I'm going to destroy them. I mean, think about it. Millions of believers have been killed through the centuries. Why hasn't God put an end to that? And why here does he say, well, just wait a little bit longer. There's a few more believers who are going to be martyred for my name. Why doesn't he stop it right then if he is sovereign, holy, and true? You guys, maybe, uh, maybe he's allowing these people to suffer, these Christians to suffer so much on this earth so their future reward is greater. Maybe he's allowing the rulers of that time a longer time in order to repent. Like he says in, in Romans, Romans 2, where he talks about the patience of God, the kindness of God should lead us to repentance. Maybe that. But the truth is this, you guys. Um, If there is one thing the book of Revelation teaches, and some of you are going to have a hard time accepting this, but if there is one thing the book of Revelation teaches me, it is this. The world does not revolve around us. It revolves around a holy God and his plan. And it's all about how do we fit into that plan. Hey, do you understand that? The world does not revolve around you or me. The world revolves around God, and we fit into his plan. It is not about everything revolving around us, and God fits into our plan and makes things work the way we think it should. See, Colossians 1.16 says that all things were created by him and for him. This world that God created is created for him to glorify him, to bring honor to him. The truth is, is if God sees fit and he says, you know what, this is the way that the most glory will be brought to my name and and, and I fit into that picture by possibly me having to suffer in order to bring him glory, then so be it. And we just are grateful that we are even in that plan. But the book of Revelation, I think above all other books in the Bible, helps us to understand that the world doesn't revolve around us. It's about a holy God and how all things work together to bring him honor and glory in the end. And here God sees fit that these believers suffer for his name to bring him the greatest amount of glory. And uh, there's a lot of things on this earth that we won't understand. Um, But I believe that uh, on the other side we will. We'll understand why it brought God the most glory for things to happen that way. But right now, while we're on this side, we just have to accept that the world does not revolve around us. We are a part of God's plan. Then he goes on, <clears throat> verse 12, and he opens the sixth seal. And you guys, this is where it gets really bizarre. Okay? Verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. 
Okay, so here you have Jesus breaking open the sixth seal. And now what John sees is he says he sees a great earthquake on the earth. And then what he sees is he sees the sun turn black. Okay, he says the sun turns black and then the moon turns red. Now some people right here go, you know what, that can't, you know what, is that really going to happen? Maybe this symbolizes something. But you guys, you got to understand something. Just one of the princi- principles of biblical interpretation is that if the literal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. That means if, if this could make sense literally, you just have to accept it as it is and say, well, probably literal then. Rather than trying to metaphorize it, or how do you say that word, whatever, you know, just, just, just sim- make everything go away by saying, ah, oh, it probably symbolizes something else. No, I believe this literally happens. He says the moon turns red like blood. The sun turns black. And then he goes on and he says that the stars in the sky begin to fall to the earth. And the word for stars can also mean uh, uh, smaller heavenly bodies. It doesn't have to be the actual stars. It can mean, you know, meteors, asteroids. And I believe that's what he's talking about right here. They begin to pummel the earth. I try to picture this. The sun just turns dark. The moon turns red. You see all these meteors and all these asteroids begin to pelt the earth. He says it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a fig tree. When the figs are totally ripe and a strong wind comes and all the figs just fall to the ground, blah, 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 blah. He says, man, that's the way it looked like with all these meteorites coming on the earth, blah, blah, just nailing, pummeling the earth. And he says uh, in verse 14, he says, the, the sky receded like a scroll. You know how when you unroll a scroll... You just let it go, and he goes, Vroom. he goes, man, that's, that's the way the heavens look like. All the heavens just kind of roll up, Vroom. blah, 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 blah. You know, just all this just chaos falling upon the earth. The sun is black. The moon is red. I mean, it's just, it's horrifying. It's intense. And he says that every mountain and island was removed from its place. The whole world as we know it has fallen apart. It's completely changing before John's eyes here. He says, this is going to take place in the end times. Now, you guys, some of you get to this point and you go, I don't believe it. That's nonsense. Come on, that's, that's, like, a, that's like a movie. Could God really do that? I mean, that's crazy. Could God really have all this stuff happen? That, that's too bizarre to actually believe it will happen. See, but to me, I go, that's not crazy. That's not bizarre. What's bizarre is what's going on right now. And what I mean by that is think about it, you guys. Reason with me for a second. You talk about bizarre. Right now, the core of our earth, if you, if you duck down here, the core of our earth is about 7,000 degrees. It's just this boiling hot core. And yet you've got this big ball that is covered with water, 70% of it. There's water, and it's spinning around at 1,000 miles an hour right now. You ever driven 1,000 miles an hour? My wife says it's crazy. And uh, <laughs> you're, you're going 1,000 miles an hour right now. Think about this. Okay? And this big ball of heat, water, mixture, you're flying at 1,000 miles an hour, and we're orbiting around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour right now. 67,000 miles an hour we are flying around the sun. And, and we're at, at just the right distance. See, the sun has this gravitational pull that keeps us close enough to the sun so that we don't freeze to death. Yet the earth has this magnetic field that kind of keeps us far enough away from everything so we don't burn. Do you realize that just a little bit closer to the sun and we would all die? And just a tiny bit further from the sun and we would freeze to death. And the earth is turned on this little axis so that we can experience these four different seasons and know what it's like to be cold or hot. And yet all of this is going on. We are flying around the sun right now. 67,000 miles an hour. Not only that, but the sun every second, every second, the sun sheds about one million tons of matter into space. And none of that hits us because of this magnetic field that's all surrounding us. So think about it, you guys. You and I are just sitting here right now as we are flying around the sun at the perfect distance, 
not hitting anything, spinning at a thousand miles an hour in this ball of heat that's covered with water. And we go, yeah, that's normal. <laughs> you guys, what I'm trying to explain is this is crazy that everything works the way that it works. When you look at God's creation, you go, that's amazing. For him to destroy it, that would be easy. It's, it's how in the world did he create all this and the eight other planets and, and everything that's flying around in space and just works in perfect order. I was at the store of knowledge yesterday. <laughs> you tell, I, I was reading all, all these uh, those books. And, uh, but I, I bought this little solar system because <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to illustrate to you, okay, you've got all these things, you know, just kind of twirling around and missing each other and you're just working perfectly. You know, the gravitational pulls, the magnetic force, and everything is working perfectly the way God designed it. That is what is crazy. That is what is amazing. To destroy that is easy. Watch. <laughs> you got to understand. See... We look at the book of Revelation and we go, no way. Could God really cause this to happen? And I'm going, no, wait a second. Look at the world we are living on right now. That is what is amazing. I mean, the stars falling from the skies and everything else, that's, that's like what is expected. And the Bible says there is going to come a time when this universe that God has created is going to be destroyed as we know it. And the result is verse 15. As it happens, it says in verse 15, it says, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? What happens as the earth is falling apart? It, it's, it talks about how the kings, the princes, the generals, all of the most powerful men on the earth are running. They're scared for their lives. He's showing here the most powerful men to show that, you know what, there's no such thing as status. Status doesn't matter. There's God and there's man, and that's all you need to know. And it says that here are the most powerful men on earth who are running and just screaming to the rocks, would you hide us, would you cover us, would you kill us? Because I can't stand the wrath of God. It says, who can stand the wrath of the Lamb? Who is coming to destroy the world? It is the Lamb himself. You guys, this is about Jesus Christ coming to destroy the world, to pour out his wrath upon the world. And the people recognize it then. They recognize this is about God. This is not normal. This is God. And they are scared for their lives. And uh, I want you to understand something. This lamb that they're talking about that is coming to destroy the world is the same lamb that came 2,000 years ago to save the world and to die for the world. Because that's what makes this so amazing because maybe the only thing more intense than the wrath of God is the love of God. That a holy, all-powerful God who created this universe and created these people on this little earth loved the people on this earth so much that he would send his own son down onto this earth to pay the penalty for their sins. You see, this wrath that I've described, I deserve that. You des we all deserve God's wrath. But God loved us so much that rather than punishing us for our rebellion and our sin, He loved us so much, He had His own Son come down on this earth to prove, to demonstrate His love for us. And He had Him die on a cross, and on that cross He was paying the penalty for our sins. And the Bible says that if we believe that, if we accept Him as our Lord and Savior, that we can escape this wrath of God. Because it was all poured out on Jesus on the cross if you are willing to accept it. And that's why Jesus said he wanted us to take of the bread and to eat it. Because this symbolizes his body. In a moment, we're going to take communion. And this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. When we eat it, we think of God, the creator, actually becoming a human being, becoming flesh, then having his body broken for us. He took God's wrath for us. That if we believe in him, 
we don't have to face it. Now, some of you have never taken communion before. Because communion, the Bible says, is only for those who believe. Okay, this is something that is given to believers. But maybe today, you listen to my message and you think, you know what? I do believe in that. I do, I do believe I was created by that God. I do believe he sent his son to die for me. If that's true, man, as, as this is being passed around, you can just pray directly to God. And you can tell God, God, I do believe I was created by you and for you. I do believe I've sinned against you and rebelled against you in my life. But I believe you love me so much you sent your son to die for me. And I accept him now as my Savior and my Lord. You can just pray that on your own to God. You don't need me. You don't need anyone else. And if you pray that and you truly mean that, then this may be the first time you ever take of the bread. Because by taking it, you're telling God, I believe in your son. And so as the ushers uh, come around and pass the bread, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Oh, Father, when I think of your power, and I think that you are such an incredible God, a holy, all-powerful, sovereign God, to think that you would send your son to die for us, it's just absolutely amazing. And so, God, we don't take of this bread or this cup lightly. We take it with reverence, with awe, because you poured out your life that we could become your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This cup represents the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ for our sakes. You guys, if there's one thing you get from today, I hope you understand God's power and yet his love. Uh, Jesus Christ, who was coming to destroy, but first came to save. You guys, all because he loved us. And... Uh, when we take this cup, it's representing his actual blood that was shed for us. That's why we don't take it lightly. This is something we do with absolute reverence because we are so grateful for what God has done for us. Let's take this cup together. Father, we thank you. God, it is amazing to think of what you did for us and what you do for us every day. God, we don't deserve it. And we repay you oftentimes with rebellion and our own sin, and we're so sorry for that. But we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from that sin and forgives us. Thank you, Father, for paying the price for us because we fear your wrath. And we thank you that we no longer have to be under it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, the ushers are going to take an offering, but... Some of you, maybe today, this is the first time you understood what God is going to do. And maybe it's the first time you understood what God has done for you. And maybe you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Maybe this is the first time you finally understood it and said, you know what? I don't want to be on the other side of God's wrath. I want to be on His side. I want to be under His grace. If you made that decision today, or maybe you have some questions, would you just indicate that on your, on your card and just throw that in, in the, the offerings that goes around? Just check off the box that said, I accept that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So we can help you understand the next steps and baptism and how to proclaim that publicly and get started, but only if you're serious about the decision you made today. And so as the ushers come and they get, you know, take the offering, man, I, I hope you just see that, you know what, God has given us so much. And hopefully you give today, not out of obligation or guilt or anything like that, but just out of the joy in your heart, going, you know what, God has given me so much, I'm thrilled to give to him today.